Well, welcome everybody. It's been a few weeks since we've been on air and this is a special. So we said that we are pausing all things podcast for a few weeks because we've got a few events and some craziness going on. And we have now reactivated our podcast and we have none other than Louise Holland, who's the managing director uh, of, is it Holland Alexander, the firm, right? Yeah. And Louise is actually the organizer of this Stackfest event, which has actually made us kind of grind down uh, our studio, get our studio all ready for this amazing event that is coming. Uh, Louise, welcome to the Bitstocks podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. How's your day going? Good, thank you, Michael, for having me here today. It's brilliant to be a part of this zany uh, entertainment show and uh, a, true, <laughs> a true honor to share this time with you. So thank you for the opportunity. Ah, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming on. So you've been in the event space and running uh, Holland Alexander for quite some time now. It's about 20 years, correct? Or over 20 years now. Was it 2005 you incorporated? That's it, yeah. I've been working in events for uh, a little bit longer than that, but I'd rather not use the numbers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it ages me somewhat, but I will say for some time. Uh, I'm really excited to be working with you and here East, Staffordshire University of London, and delivering Stackfest uh, in well, two weeks' time. You're, you're hyper-current. Right, so you've been doing this for some time, but you're hyper current. So you're 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 now putting on an esport event with with Stackfest, which we are obviously uh, sponsoring, and we are very active on day one and day two. Um, how did that come to be? Before I get into anything else, I mean, just build me up, really. I guess your career, and then how you got to doing an event like Stackfest. Um. Well, we've been mulling over doing something in the games and esports space in the UK for quite some time. We've been doing activations over in San Fran for GDC and E3 LA for quite a while and just waited to find the right products in which to bring a bit of that um, business commercial savviness that the states do so well in terms of games and esports into the UK. And really just waited to make sure that we could have the right partners, find the right venue, which we have found the absolute best in the UK to make this happen. And uh, launched it back in terms of planning in September 2019, completely unaware, okay. as everyone was, what was just around the corner. <laughs> so our yeah. original vision was to get this delivered last September, but obviously it's been delayed uh, mm. this September. So effectively, we should be in year two. But never mind, that's okay. We'll make the most of this year and actually gives us another year of the run. So uh, we're yeah. building something that we want to deliver for at least the next three years. And what Stackfest does, which no other festival of its type does, certainly in the UK, is have three different themes of uh, interaction and thought leadership. So day one is around bringing together the esports ambition for the UK and really getting that cluster powerhouse global brands that we've got, certainly at Here East, um, thinking, talking, sharing, collaborating on how we build Here East and all the partners, including yourselves there, as a real powerhouse for esports into the future as an esports cluster. And then deck two, we really focus on education and pipeline and bringing through yeah. the next generation and making sure that we really give them the, the theory, the practical know-how and intros to industry so that they can go on and build their career, looking at to become a, a game maker as well as a game player. And then day three okay. is really just completely fun. It's about um, activations yeah, yeah, yeah. on the footprint, playing simulators, meeting the pro teams, uh, and just having a fantastic kind of esports Glastonbury experience. The whole site comes alive and it will be really buzzy with uh, young people, families, um, just experience esports, some for the first time, some as you know, frequent regular players, getting to meet their pro team fans um, and those that they follow. You just mentioned the the buzz line, the strap line that caught my attention with my team. So my team came to me and approached me about Stackfest. Oh, there's this amazing event called Stackfest. It sounds exciting, really exciting. It's like well up our street, well up our street. Um, and then her name's Krista, and then she goes. It was sold to me as the Glastonbury of esports. I was like, okay, you, it's like you've, you've pricked up my ears now. You've got my, you've got my attention. Cause that's, that's quite a statement. That's, that's, that's quite the statement. And you just reiterated it 
uh, just now. So that's, that's awesome. If anyone that's been Glastonbury or even remotely aware of what Glast Glastonbury is like, um, to, to even have that as kind of like a, a, a statement and then thrown in gaming into that, um, that's going to be a party for anyone to come and attend. Yeah. So you, you mentioned E3 as well. That's like, <laughs> that's Mount Everest of when it comes to gaming events. So what, what was your experience and involvement in E3? Was that on behalf of customers, clients? I mean, how, how long was you doing E3 and to what, to what extent was your involvement? Um, I mean, just firstly, thank you for absolutely nailing it in terms of, you know, describing what it is we're trying to build and create here with some great partners on site. Um, yeah. Yes, you know, Glasto has taken how many years to get to where it is? And we yeah, think, yeah. Um, let's start somewhere. Let's start around strategy. Let's, you know, make a, a kind of line in the sand that's built around smart design. So thinking about user experience across the three different audience types is super important in how you choreograph the content and who is delivering what aspect to it. So just in terms of the Saturday, the player action day, which is about, you know, building that esports uh, Glastonbury take is very much around different pockets of entertainment and activation, making it very family friendly and fun, and just really shortening the gap between you know the franchises, the pro teams, the excellent players that are professional athletes, and the gamers out there that enjoy watching them and seeing how they succeed in the major tournaments. Yeah. And, you know, aspire to be a pro team player. So how do we shorten that gap between, you know, through the screen to actually being in person and meeting them? So in the community arena on day three, we've got a ton of different esports teams and all of their players there that fans can come along and talk to. Well, how did you get there? And, and how, what advice can you give me? You know, I aspire to be a pro mm -hmm. team player or even just, you know, have a conversation around a particular move in a game. You know, what are their favorite cheats? You know, it's really the opportunity to meet your meet your icon in a sense and, and I think there isn't anything out there that allows you to do this yes you can go along and support in tournaments and so forth but really that divide between the pro player and the gamer I think is where we are coming in to try and reduce that gap and to make esports yeah. super accessible to everyone in society that has a passion for games and also to kind of cut a new curve in terms of how we move forward as a UK society playing games in esports, you know, and getting that commercial savviness come through, which is why we're delighted to have so many of the different franchises on day one talking about their commercial business journey and how they're working with brands and partners and sponsors to build their own uh, brand profile, their own reach, you know. Um, I think it's going to be a fantastic session to see all the different takes on how brands at different parts of their scale, whether they're London Esports, London United, um, all the way through to Excel, just how are they building their brands and how are they, you know, reaching out their audience and innovating along the way. So it, it's a fantastic opportunity to see a whole range of different types of businesses and, and their takes it's, on Esports. It's, just, it's incredible. I mean, I grew up playing... One of the games now, which is very big in esports, uh, but it, back in my day, it wasn't esports. I was just playing for fun and bragging rights. So I grew up playing a game called Counter-Strike. Uh, so to all the nerds out there who watch this, um, I started off at Counter-Strike 1.2. I built myself up to being not far off pro level when it got to 1.5, 1.6. Um, and it, it even got to the point where I was in a clan and other clans wouldn't play us unless I ran a scan, a system scan. So that's to prove ultimately that I'm, I'm not cheating. And it was myself, a friend of mine who was better than me at the time, who ironically now works with me uh, and build, helps build gravity uh, at, at Bitstocks today. And we were so into the subject matter of gaming, but never in a million years did we think that it would turn into what it's what it's turned into today. I think we even remember joking uh, as 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 kids saying, "Ah, oh, like imagine if we could just play video games uh, for a living all day long." And uh, lo and behold, probably some of the big names that are huge now, like for instance, uh, Phase Clan, Hundred Thieves, uh, Nature. These people were kind of gaming around the same period of time. Um, I was gaming. Uh, but I just, I just didn't see it going that way. And I just pursued business. But to now be very much involved in not just say a, a esport event, me 
seeing the emergence of esports a couple of years ago. Uh, and then funnily enough, when the pandemic hit, I really thought, you know what, esports is going to seriously, seriously, seriously take off. Uh, and where the world's going, like hyper digitization, um, obviously the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency movement as a way of lubricating all of these different communication channels and doing all of these new interesting things uh, with gaming. We've now kind of converged to a point where all of these passions kind of all roll into one. So whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a gamer, you're a nerd, right? All of these things it is that I subscribe uh, subscribe to. Um, we're now in a world where it's no longer a case of, okay, professional footballer or going down and playing sports, or any degree of even viewing sports is seen as this hyper, hyper, hyper physical thing. You need to be great athletic uh, shape. You need to be in a 0.1% of the point one uh, percent. Um, funnily enough, there's probably maybe a little bit of that in esports in terms of the elite gamers, but I think now that people are realizing that this is a whole new boom in industry, which for the most part, very much at its infancy, hyper, 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 uh, at its infancy. I guess what are you personally most excited about when you've seen this this movement grow? Because if you've been involved in e3 for some time. And now you're doing your own thing. You've you've obviously been very much in the scene and seen that this scene has some holes that need filling, and and, and it's grown in a new direction. What 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 are you excited about, and, and where do you see this going? I think that's a great question, Michael, and, and lots of different strands to answer within that. Um, in terms of delivering stack, um, each day has its different focus and ambition for us. When we were putting the festival design together, we had two watchwords and we really worked very hard to implement that across everything that we're doing. And those two words are unique and extraordinary. So in designing the content to fill a gap that's there, you know, we're the first team with our partners to bring something like this to the market that does have three very distinct audience groups within esports and games. Uh, there are some amazing festivals and events out there, and it's not to decry them. What we are saying is this is the first time a festival has attempted to really bridge their gap and to look at the life cycle of a gamer, if you like, from being a young person to being somebody that's in education and going forwards to university, all the way through to you know the games makers, the developers, the commercial team, social medias, you know, all those different roles that then come from being an older adult, really. Um so we've tried to follow that. And I think for me, I'm really excited to see on the Saturday, young people bringing their parents and guardians and brothers and sisters along and just helping them to understand what it is they do when they say they're playing games. And it isn't, yes, it's social, yes, it's entertainment. But for those that want to carve a career from it, I think it's really important that families around that young person have the opportunity to really understand where this can take their loved one. And, you know, yes, it's, very, yes. it's a very serious business, but there's absolutely incredible room for innovation, for talent, for new ideas, you know, the energy that the new generation will bring into what's already a thriving marketplace. I think is super exciting. And you can see how that will dovetail into new technologies, new user experience, and thinking about how young people engage with those products and where they take those ideas. That's a very powerful point. Very powerful point. Just simple thing of uh, a kid coming down with their parents, um, just for the parents to see an industry, right? Not a video game, to see an industry. That's a very powerful point. Very, very powerful point. One of the, in fact, one of the guys coming down um, that I've invited, he's 19, just done, um, his financial exams, I think he just passed uh, financial exams, and his dad's ex-finance, very successful ex-finance. Um, and I said to him, I was like, your kid's pretty good. Like he's, he's, he races in Formula One, uh, 2021, quick, very, very quick. I was like, yo, your, I was like, your kid's pretty good. Uh, don't, don't, don't be surprised if he ain't gonna pursue the finance route that you want him to pursue. Like he's, he's quick. Um, they're coming down to the event uh, because I think it's important. Like dad's really into cars and stuff as well. So he, he gets the whole simulator stuff, but he treats it as, I guess, what a parent would do. It's just a game, a little bit of fun. Uh, but his, his son, his boy is actually really, really quick. So that would be a very powerful thing for him to see just how much of an industry 
uh, this is. And I can tell when I hear it, I spoke like when I spoke to his son and multiple people like his son, where they're at this period in their life where they can see an amazing new opportunity right? A genuine new opportunity. If you didn't, if you throw in, say, the social media boom, you throw in esports, gaming, you throw in crypto, you throw in NFTs, right? Uh, kids are looking at all of these things thinking, like, this is my time. Like, this, this, this is my opportunity, right? Um, but then you've got, I guess, the parents, you know, like, I'm a parent, you know, we, I'm always gonna, we always think we know better, right? Um, say, okay, go down a more traditional more traditional route. That That is a really, 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 really uh, Im important point. So anyone or any kids who are watching this, um, <laughs> get your parent down to, st to Stackfest. Uh, or day two, you said, is, is, is um, a good day, day for Day two that. is the education and day three is yeah, the yeah, way yeah. where you can bring your family along. But I would say, yeah. you know, what we think about in terms of traditional sports for this generation coming through, traditional for them will be esports and games at this level, if not greater. So it's really, it's really about, you know, the older generation perhaps just getting a bit more savvy and, and kind of well-versed in terms of this new metaverse and how we should really be thinking much more broadly about how young people use technology, not just for entertainment, but to build their careers and to innovate and to drive us forward as a society. You know, you can see how technology and games is, revolutionizing so many different sectors you know i saw an advert last night for gucci with uh, miley cyrus you know she animates into a character that flies through a garden spraying perfume but even yeah, five yeah, years yeah. ago you would not have seen you know such a high-end mature brand using an animated cartoon into its you know Absolutely. very expensive advert that's super glossy and shot you know somewhere like new york you know so you can see the the transfer into the understanding that their marketplace in terms of any brand is a lot younger and how they consume product is, is yes. changing dramatically and brands have to step forward with that. And I yes, think we're absolutely. seeing that across the whole kind of, you know, the marketplace. All sectors, really. We're entering a world of mixed reality. Right? Absolutely. Uh, you mentioned a big word there, metaverse, right? So this is the world that gravity is building for. Right, so we want to be the bank for the metaverse. Uh, all of our technology is geared around the metaverse, mixed reality, and it's it's a trend that isn't gonna t that is going to touch every single uh, industry. Now, when it comes to NFTs, I know you've got some aspirations there as well. Is it Galileo Racing, yeah, digital racing? Oh, well done. Yeah, yeah ten, 10 points. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> where where I know. You, I said I had a, I had a snoop. I had a good, good, good snoop actually of your of your Twitter. It's very clear. Horses and cats are your thing, oh, right? Wow. <laughs> horses, horses and cats are very much your thing. And I couldn't help but notice your NFT idea is interlinked with horses yeah. uh, as well. So, 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 run me through that one. Uh, super, you know, excited about NFTs, and I'm also looking at a fashion vertical with NFTs. But okay. Coming back to sport uh, and particularly horse racing, we were going to be working on a program over the summer that has been delayed that would have seen NFTs going into horse racing in a big way for the first time. So we've just put that project back into the gate for now and that gives us a bit more room to focus on Stack and some other international projects that we're working on. Uh, and another business, which I can't really talk too much about, but it's exactly what this space is all about in terms of games and esports. That will be coming, okay. will be launching probably October into Q4, I think, this year. So maybe we can do a podcast about that another time, and I, I can get you engaged in that, Michael. Oh, you're teasing, teasing, you're kicking it, <laughs> kicking it down the line. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, horses for me is is kind of my entertainment, I guess. Uh, very passionate. I'm an owner of a number of horses. Uh, in syndicates. Uh, I've been around horse racing for a very long time and I think it's one of those traditional sports and this is where it gets really um, exciting to see where innovation can go because horse racing is one of the oldest sports in the world mm. and uh, it has quite a traditional in some senses an old school approach to its experience on course you know they've only just started moving into cashless payments you know when you go mm. to the tote or the bucket, traditionally it's cash only. They've only this yeah. year forced by the pandemic when gates reopened for the public to reattend. Um, is 
who allow cashless payments on track, you know, and this is 2021. It's only wow. just started. Wow. You know, maybe yeah. there's a role for gravity in there somewhere as well to help. I was just thinking. I was just thinking. I was like, oh, I've got some questions for you offline. <laughs> <laughs> we can put a horse head in that uh, oh, in the gravity logo. No yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad, dad. Um, yeah, you know, I think that the moments that NFTs really create are those unique sporting glory successes that everyone wants to have, you know, on their phone, on their on their yeah. wearable tech. To, to really solidify how engaged they are with their sport. But also it's those bragging rights, isn't it? You know, they've got this unique piece of content that was mined the only five or ten of or even one of. Uh, and it yeah. gives you that kind of, uh, I don't know, gravitas and status that others that simply have a ticket in terms of you know building that kind of profile just can't compete with. So it is super competitive. It is quite luxury, I think, for now. But we're interested in making it much more accessible to the wider public and Galileo Digital Racing will do that in terms of capturing the moments of, you know, Frank Vittori jumps off his horse having won a full-timer at Ascot as an example. You know, if you were to sell that NFT, give some of the um, income through to charity within that sport, I think it's a really nice way of kind of bringing lots of threads together. But horse racing is innovating, but it is also quite a long way behind thinking about user experience and particularly that UX with technology. And what we're trying to do is to raise the game and thinking about, you know, the user experience fundamentally is the design for everything else that happens. So how do we make, you know, these great moments that happen on the track around the horse, around the jockey, around the race itself? Um, how do we make that really um quite memorable, quite keepable, you know, everything mm. that NFT is, how do we do that and make it, you know, something that's um, not been done before in this way? And of course, once we start to get through the UK market, horse racing is internationally very, very popular in other destinations. So we'll start to then bridge the gap into those sectors. Um, so we've got quite an ambitious plan for that. I'm not going to say we're going to create a, a glass and free for horse racing through NFTs. <laughs> but what I am saying is, you know, there's a gap there and there, there's nobody else doing it in the way that we think we can. Uh, we just need a bit of time to get that back off the ground. Um, but we will do it and we'll do it with some gusto too. Wicked. That's what I love about NFTs. To me, it is the first time in seven years that I've been in this space professionally that I feel crypto is mainstream. And the reason there's, there's, there's a couple of different ways to take that statement on the surface, great crypto is mainstream or uh, below it's just not even more than an inch. You realize that we're not really ready to be mainstream. And the reason why I say that is that the, you've mentioned a few different times on this uh, conversation, user experience, right? And I think the user experience in the world of cryptos and Bitcoin is horrific, point blank horrific. And when we now have the world, the mainstream knocking on our doors, it can't be horrific anymore. Uh, that the world is coming to us as, if you just look at myself or anyone in the crypto space, as glorified plumbers, right? We're all a bunch of Mario and Luigi's, okay? And the reason why I say that is that <clears throat> every single blockchain solution is just a plumbing system, right? So for individuals such as yourself, who is not a plumber, right? You're an entrepreneur and a kick-ass one at that, right? So you've got all these different ideas and you want to basically build a house. That's what entrepreneur does. You build a house on top of some technical foundations, right? So, and just like anyone, when you view a house, you buy a house, I want to see the kitchen. I want to see the dining room. I want to see what the bathrooms look like. I want to see if I've got a nice kick-ass balcony that looks, after, looks over my bottom ass garden. Like these are the things that we experience, right? Because you're building a house. That's, that's what you experience. When is the last time you ever asked the letting agent or the sales agent, what is the size and dimension of your plumbing system, right? You just don't care because when you use the faucet, it works. When you try to flush the toilet, it works. As long as it works and you never have to pick up the phone to the plumber, you don't care. In the world of crypto, that's not the case. Um, in the world of crypto, it's like they, they want the plumbing system to be frontline and center. They want to sell you the plumbing first uh, and not even talk about the house because no one's even really building a proper house. Um, and then you realize due to fees being out of control that you try to flush the toilet 
and your house stinks of shit because you can't flush it, right? Fees are just completely out of control, it's crazy. So this is an experience that people have had on Ethereum, this is an experience that people have had on pretty much a variety of these blockchains. Uh, the way that they're addressing it in the NFT world is they're kind of going down a very exclusive route. So they're doing spin-offs and they're saying, okay, this is my blockchain solution. Here is say uh, Lionel Messi's NFT collection, Floyd Mayweather's NFT collection. That's the house, right? And they're hiding the plumbing system. They're deeply, deeply, deeply hiding the plumbing system. And this is why the vast majority of these platforms don't even allow you to take your assets off the platform, right? It's got to stay there. Yeah. And if you do try to take it off the platform, uh, you've got to use a combination of different techniques, Trezor, MetaMask, um, and a variety of different, say, software solutions in order to take possession of your rare digital item. Right. So it's great mainstreams at our door, but in terms of the application and the, and the experiences it is that we've built up until this point, I say until we release the suite that we've got going on with Gravity, shameless plug, um, the user experience just is not going to be, is not going to be addressed. So for me, I'm watching all of these things combine, right? And I'm like, okay, what, we all talk about the meta net, we talk about IOT, we talk about AI, the emergence of all of these amazing systems converging and communicating with one another, right? If we build a world of data silos, we're never going to have this, this, this metaverse world and meta net world that everyone's talking about. You kind of have it, but if you want to associate it to, I guess, intelligence, right? Um, it's never going to be like Jarvis. It's not even going to be like Siri or Google uh, Assistant. It would be like a chat bot that we had 15 years ago, right? And that is the experience today in crypto, but that is the great opportunity of fixing that, that user that user experience. Because what I want to see is a ready player one world where you've got everyone interoperating within one holistic ecosystem. So in this case, it's ready player one, that's a game. So it's kind of easy to have everyone into one place and swapping assets, right? But what about what ready player one truly demonstrated is you can take something from within that game and it's got real world applicability, right? Um, so whether that be monetary value outside of that game, or what about if I took an asset, let's say a laser gun, um, that I could then transfer over to another one of uh, these video games, right? Because now that asset that I earned within that video game, I can now transfer to another video game, and now it's, it's more valuable for the luxury of doing so. So really all blockchains are there to do, and I say it's predominantly Bitcoin, is just there to help a user protect and enforce their property rights. So it shows that you, Louise, own this item at this time, okay? And then gives you the right to then transfer that item onto any other uh, individual. But you need to do that without ever having to worry about, I need to pick up the phone to the plumber because our fees are gone out of control. So for me, NFTs and the way that NFTs are really exposing this, this uh, analogy that I've used for quite some time now, uh, but it's really exposing the poor plumbing systems that a lot of these platforms are being built upon. But also it's really showing that we're now entering an era that if you can get the fee, the cost of creation down, right now NFT is roughly about $100, $200 to create one if you're using a predominant solution out there, which is Ethereum, right? On our gravity solution, if you create NFT, it costs two cents to five cents, reliably, consistently, it's all on chain. Now, the surface statistic is, okay, $200, 2P, considerably cheaper, right? So that's, that's a very easy argument to show, okay, this is why our solution is, is better on the surface. But what really turns me on is that, okay, if it really is 2P, that means human creation consciousness can flow now. Now you could think about, okay, what do I, NFT doesn't need to be a B pool that's $70 million or a million dollars or 10 grand, 20 grand. Mm -hmm. uh, an NFT should be utilized. In my opinion, a great use case is how do I build a better community, yeah. right? So if you think about like these gamers, esporters, these YouTube social influencers, like simple thing of how do I get more people to watch my YouTube video? We'll hide money in it. 
right? Put a challenge in it. And then you say to your audience, okay, well, if you view, uh, find the hidden treasure in my YouTube video, right? Or I went to a, I went to Glastonbury, right? Follow me on my socials and try and work out where I digitally graffitied my latest album drop, right? So you've got to follow me throughout the whole weekend on Glastonbury just for, to see, to get the hint of where I hid that digital item. That's user engagement. Now, if it costs me 200 bucks every single time to do something like that, I'm not gonna use it in these experimental ways, mm -hmm. right? But if it costs you the negligible amount of money, uh, then now we can create real cultivation of community. That's what I am really, really excited about in terms of NFTs and what it means for brands. And that's why we've been having really interesting conversations with brands uh, because we've kind of taken this direction and this narrative from a technological standpoint, really low cost of creation. But the more important thing is, okay, how uh, how's the user experience going to be when you're utilizing these items and you're chopping and changing them between all of these different uh, places. And that's something that I think we've really, really nailed. So we're going to do a, a, a sneak peek at Stackfest. We haven't released any of this stuff publicly uh, as to how NFTs should truly be done and how you manage it and how it's all about really your experience and you. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing a sneak peek at, wow. at Stackfest. So you've got to make sure you come check that out. That sounds really exciting. So when you said that you're parking, well, you're not parking, you just put it back in the cage for now. Uh, is this a project that you're going to be pushing out next year uh, on, on the NFT side? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, we've got some conversations going on that would allow us to really do something pretty cool probably end of Q1 next year. Uh, and in the meantime, we've got another business that we're launching with some partners based in the UK and uh, US which is a new games product that will be really, really, really cool. Mm. Uh, and there's a huge gap for it in the market right now. So I think that's kind of leapfrogged over our Galileo plans, but um, yeah. that will happen. We just need to pace ourselves for the, the marathon as well as the sprint, as you know, as an entrepreneur. When you're <laughs> building the house, you know, often things don't quite uh, go through oh, definitely. timeline the way you want. Definitely. <laughs> it's interesting what you said about people coming to view a house and asking about the plumbing. I actually have my house on the market right now. So I'll be thinking of yeah. that tonight when I've got a <laughs> I'll be like, best plumbing, in, best, yeah. best plumbing out there. <laughs> it's really big and it's really easy. And you know, there's no mistakes. Yeah. So. It's not going to cost you five cents every time you pull the paint. Five cents will be a blessing. It's two hundred dollars, a hundred dollars on, on, on these other solutions, which is which is crazy, absolutely crazy. Apps, yeah. So I'll be thinking of that later. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, yeah. But yeah, just in terms of like gravity and thinking about cashless society and so forth. What's what do you think is going to happen with ATMs of the future? You know, five, ten years down the line, Michael. Do you think? they'll be uh, still present or do you think they'll be redundant or will something else take their place? Um, I don't think we'll have ATMs 10 years from now. Uh, I think there's a high probability cash is abolished uh, 10 years from now from, for a variety of reasons. I think we're entering a period where the next stage of this uh, pandemic um, is going to be economic. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the aspect that everyone's just kind of coasting underneath and not realizing that the way that this has been handled, irrespective of how people feel about it, um, you just drive down the high street now, you can see the effects, Yeah. right? And part of this, I would actually argue, really pushes ahead the tech agenda massively these last 18 months, uh, 20 months, which me as a business owner, entrepreneur yourself as well, we're privy to that and we're riding that wave and we're making sure that we're going to continue to be re relevant, but it doesn't mean I like what I'm seeing. Right. And I think that if bankers and governments know that a economic crisis is on the way, they're printing money left, right. And so I think we're close to a trillion dollars a week almost now with the US uh, in terms of printing. I mean, at that rate, what you're going to lose 40% of your purchasing power in like 12 months. Mm -hmm. It's it's crazy what, what is going on. So to answer in a very long winded way your, your question around cash machines, I don't see them 
been able to try and stop the bleeding if they did not abolish cash. Because what do you do traditionally, right? If you feel that government overreach is made coupled with um, all time low in confidence in government. So we've got them overreaching and then the sentiment is we're not very confident because of this overreaching, then naturally people start to get very conservative with money, right? They stop spending, they start to become very conservative with, with money. And that then causes a stagnation effect uh, economically. So to prevent that cycle, um, say people traditionally will think, okay, let me do a run on the bank. Let me go and get my money, take possession of my money. Let me, let me put it under the mattress. Pretty much what, like, what, I, what our parents would have done, right? That mentality, which is still in our society today, because we have situations like Northern Rock, Lima Brothers, these things weren't too long ago, right? But if you cut that off and there is no way of actually getting money out the system, it's all just digital on screen to, from the banker's standpoint, how do I prevent the fishbowl of liquidity that's got all these bullet holes in it? How do I prevent it leaking uh, water? They're just gonna tape up the bullet holes and prevent you from being able to do withdrawals. So from a strategic standpoint, I've just seen the introduction of say COVID, how that was utilized to go from 20 pounds on cashless to 40 pounds uh, on, on cashless. And I just see that trend just massively uh, continuing. We are going, exclusively digital. This has influenced the Gravity business model massively. So we started building Gravity, knocking on the door for about three years ago in anticipation of this climate that we're in today. Um, I even put out a video in, I think September, 2018, uh, speaking about a lot of what's happening uh, today and predicting uh, uh, quite a bit of what's happening today. So we built a solution that if we lose cash, what I like about cash is the privacy aspect. I take out a 10 pound note out of my pocket. I give it to Swen here, who's, who, who runs our studio. The government didn't need to be involved in that transaction. They didn't need to start a transaction. I took value, I exchanged value. There was no intervention, right? We need that. That's a really great quality. Privacy is a great quality. It's a human birthright, in my opinion. Cash emulates that from a financial standpoint. So how do we maintain privacy um, when we're in a completely digital based economy? That's why we've built Gravity. That's why we've built a new financial system on top of Bitcoin to simulate the cash-like qualities and basically be like the new Switzerland in this new digital world. Um, because I do think cash machines, if they last 10 years, I'll actually be quite, quite surprised. Uh, I see it being less than that and sooner than that. What's your vision for Gravity in five, 10 years time? Ready Player One. It really is. It really, it really is that. Um, so, Gravity. The big mission for five years is really AI. Okay, that's really predominantly what Gravity is 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 about. But there's components to that. So, what we're doing first is we've built a operating system for Bitcoin. So, if you consider Bitcoin like your your PC box, right? Now that PC box ain't going to be useful to most people unless you've got Microsoft Windows on it, right? So Microsoft Windows is the Gravity operating system and the Gravity uh, bank, uh, money bank that we're building and the Gravity ID solution and our NFT solution. These are like applications we've built on top of our operating uh, system. The reason why we've gone down a holistic approach in terms of being a Monzo competitor, or Revolut competitor, gone down the personal banking route is because Combining that with micropayments, true micropayments and transparent technology means that we can actually start building the neural net of this meta net world that we, we've been speaking about for the last half an hour, right? Because in this new world, data is the oil. Human consciousness produces the data that we now treat as oil, right? So human consciousness is oil. How do you put a meter, a payment meter to human consciousness? right? Because human experiences are going to change once we could quantize time economically, because everything in life is factored by time. Time is order and all chaos. The problem is, is our banks, our payment systems cannot break down time to a small enough denomination that makes it a life-changing experience for us as human beings. So an example of that would be, we all pay electricity, right? 
but you pay it monthly or quarterly, right? Even though it's billed 14 pence per kilowatt, right? You pay it monthly or you pay it quarterly because we don't have an economic system that can allow you to pay that live per second, right? Because we can't break it down in small enough denominations. Well, with gravity and with what the gravity uh, ecosystem can do is, well, you can take one penny and you could break it down to the eighth decimal place. So now I've got a fraction of a penny. So what that means in terms of changing the human experience? Well, now I can watch Netflix and not have Netflix wholesale my attention at $9.99 a month. Now I can consume Netflix based on my true intention, right? And they can bill me by the second. So I can instead pay, instead of $9.99 a month, I could pay two pounds a month, I could pay three pounds a month. So as a solution, what I want to see five years from now is how gravity as an operating system enabled entrepreneurs to build applications and widgets that allow us to better value, quantize, and price time. Because that's all I see as really being a human experience. We've, we've got time um, and our relationship uh, with time is, is our labor, uh, uh, our input. So if we just have a much better way of harmonizing time and human production on a planet with all of this great automation of systems and uh, the internet and data, I genuinely believe that we have a better humanity. And that's what gravity's role is, is we're just trying to build financial tools that we genuinely believe humanity needs to transition through this period that we're in right now, where if we, if we go down this extreme automated world unchecked, it's going to lead into the most draconian mark of the beast-like scenarios okay. that, that people have prophesized um, about for, for decades. And data integrity and keeping ownership of our data is, is everything. We can't just keep feeding a machine just because it's free and thinking that there's no repercussions uh, for that. So Gravity, along with a whole other bunch of individuals and entrepreneurs in this industry are flipping that model on its head where we say, okay, Louise, you, you should own your own data. You are the, say, consciousness producing machine that is generating all of this data that everyone wants from you. I think that you should get a better return on it yourself. Uh, and that's what Gravity is designed to do. Um, is, is to suit you up for this new MetaNet world and allow you to earn the vast majority of the income as you navigate your way through uh, that MetaNet world. So, This yeah, is what you're going to be talking about when you're on the stage at day one, is that correct? Um, I'm going to be speaking about Bitcoin, well, esports, Bitcoin, and NFTs, okay. right? So these are three things just beautifully match-made, uh, in in heaven and something that I for the last five years have just been very excited about to see these things get closer and closer and closer and closer together um, so yeah I, I, I'll be doing that and at the end of it I'll probably show a little snippet of our solution that that really brings this forward and like I said gets you strapped up for the new meta net world um, but I, I, I really think that this period that the planet's going to go through in terms of really utilizing technology to liberate humanity, right? Esports is well in there, well in there. Really, really utilizing technology uh, in 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 order to liberate. I would love to see how you're going to use uh, the technology and NFTs in, in even just like your your events mm. uh, moving forward. So, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on the Bitstocks podcast. I know we've been quite limited uh, on time, so unfortunately we couldn't go into more things and speak a little bit more on digitization in terms of NFTs and also the event space. Uh, but I will be seeing you here, my dear, in two weeks. We'll be pushing the flag for all things Stackfest leading up to that event. Um, and for anyone who has watched this, what is the best place for people to get in contact with you? Uh, Louise, where should I follow you? Uh, so check out the website, which is stack-fest.com. Have a look at the festival listing days and book now. So you can see Michael on the stage, limited to 25 minutes, but I'm sure it will rinse every second out of it. <laughs>
hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, Louis, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'll leave you go for your second one and we will see you in a couple of weeks, my dear. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much. No worries. All the best. See you Bye. soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for tuning back in. It's been a couple of weeks and hopefully we won't be off air for too much longer, but we've got event after event after event coming. So until the next time, peace, love and light. All the best. Hello, beautiful people. So we just recorded a special episode with none other than Louise Holland, who is the arranger and organizer of the Stack Fest Festival. And if you want to come down to the Stack Fest Festival, bear in mind, it's happening right outside our office and we are opening up our doors to the public as well. So if you want to come and check out the Bitstock studio and get your race on, it is September the 9th and the 10th. Come partake in our competition and have your chance of winning some BSV. And as always, guys, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. Hit that bell notification button and we will see you soon. And as always, peace, love and light. <laughs>